Well, good morning. God's peace to you. It's great to be with you here today. I pray that you're blessed for being here in this place. We all love an underdog story, don't we? We like to see the team who was counted out to come back and win the championship. We like to see the Rocky Balboas of the world fight their story from the bottom to the top. From the rags to riches story to the down and out to back and top stories, we love an underdog story. And these stories point to a life-giving eternal truth. They are stories of hope. Horatio Alger, an American novelist who lived in the second half of the 19th century, he wrote stories about impoverished young men who worked hard and attained what we think of today as the American dream. It's become fashionable, of course, in these days to be critical of Horatio Alder and his rags to riches story, since many of his books were written at a time when those, uh, with the hope he offered in those books was only available to white men. Racial minorities and women were excluded from Alger's stories. But what the critics fail to realize is that Alger may have lacked the vision to see how the American dream would become far more inclusive than it was in the late 1800s. The dream itself is not based on racial or gender privilege. It's based on a system of freedom where democracy, free markets, and equal opportunity make it possible for anyone of any race, both men and women, to pursue the American dream. And of course, justice is a part of that and something that continually is reformed in such a system. Well, that may be why we as Americans in particular like the underdog story. But it's a story that's been told for many, many years. Probably the greatest underdog story in the Bible is the story of David and Goliath. When David stepped out onto the field of battle to challenge Goliath, he was the epitome of an underdog. He stood feet below Goliath, who was a giant toward him, nine feet tall, towering above him. And yet, David won the day. Against all odds, he had that surprising underdog victory. And every one of us reads that story and cheers inside as we see Goliath fall. Well, as we come to this, this letter to the church at Philadelphia, we find that, that it is somewhat of an underdog story. In fact, the church at Philadelphia is, by all accounts, an underdog church. Let's begin reading together there in Revelation chapter 3. Hopefully, uh, Lee can keep up with me this morning. Uh, Revelation chapter 3 um, Chapter 3, verse 1 says, write this, or rather verse 7, we're starting. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. This is the message from the one who is holy and true, the one who has the key of David. What he opens, no one can close, and what he closes, no one can open. So right here at the beginning, writing to an underdog church, Jesus identifies himself not as the one who uh, holds the keys to the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, but uh, the keys to the doors. He's described himself previously in other letters, to the keys to death and Hades, for example. Here, it's not those keys, it's the key of David. And certainly Jesus fulfilled those messianic, messianic expectations that a son of David would reign on the throne forever. And so he is uh, of the Davidic line. He is the Messiah, the King and Deliverer. But if we go back to the story of David, we remember how it was such an unlikely likely situation that David would ever become king in the first place. And yet God chose him, and God protected him, and God gave him what he promised him, a throne, and a throne that would be occupied by his descendants forever. So the one who holds the key of David is the one who 
says uh, uh, to this church, this underdog church, I have opened a door and no one can close it. And what he closes, no one can open. It's a statement of absolute authority. Now you can imagine when you're in an underdog situation, when you feel like the odds are stacked against you, when you feel like you don't have hope, the great encouragement it would bring you to know that someone who has the authority to open doors no one can shut and close doors that no one can open is speaking to you. He has absolute authority. And he is the one who holds the key of David. Continuing there in verse 8, the Lord says to this church, I know all the things you do, and I have opened a door for you that no one can close. You have little strength, yet you obeyed my word and did not deny me. Look, I will force those who belong to Satan's synagogue, those liars who say they are Jews but are not, to come and bow down at your feet. They will acknowledge that you are the ones I love. Because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. All who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God, and they will never have to leave it. And I will write on them the name of my God, and they will be citizens in the city of my God, new, the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven from my God, and I will also write on them my new name. Anyone with ears to hear, must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Now, the thing that stands out to me as I read this letter to the church at Philadelphia is they are the church that has a little strength. A little strength. There's an old gospel song that we used to sing in church when I was younger. The initial line of the song was, little is much when God is in it. Little is much. That's the message that Jesus wants the church at Philadelphia to hear. They have a little strength, but if he is with them, it will be more than enough. Have you ever felt like an underdog? Have you ever felt like your strength simply doesn't meet the occasion. You have a little strength, but not enough. Jesus says, I will protect you. I will open a door for you and no one will close it. Sometimes we do get an inferiority complex. Lee, I'm going to take us to Numbers chapter 13 and we're going to read verses 25 through 33. Because we see here an example of when, when people do look around them and look at others and compare themselves to others, how that can steal their strength, steal their courage, take away from them the power and the assurance and the hope that God gives. In Numbers chapter 13, beginning there in verse 25, the scripture says, after exploring the land for 40 days, the men returned to Moses, Aaron, and the whole community of Israel at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. They reported to the whole community what they had seen and showed them the fruit they had taken from the land. This was their report to Moses. We entered the land you sent to us, uh, sent us to explore, and it is indeed bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here is the kind of fruit it produces, but the people living there are powerful and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. The Amalekites live in the Negev and the Hittites, Jebusites and Amorites live in the hill country. The Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and along the Jordan Valley. Now, you remember the story, the, the Hebrew children, the Israelites are set free from Egyptian bondage and they are sent out 
They're sent out into the wilderness. Because of their unbelief, that first initial generation is meant to wander in the wilderness until they pass, and then the children then are allowed to go into the promised land. So there's been one generation since they left Egypt in the hopes that God would lead them back to the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And it only took one generation for them to develop an inferiority complex. They send the spies out. They bring in their report. They say, yes, this land is everything God said it would be. But what about the people of the land? They're so powerful. Their cities are so strong and fortified. We even saw some of those giants, the descendants of Anak. Only two people, you remember, Joshua and Caleb. And Numbers 13 tells us Caleb's response. In verse 30, it says, But Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let us go at once to take the land. He said, We certainly can conquer it. Now, there's a man who didn't have an inferiority complex. He said, Let's go. What are we waiting for? It's been 40 years. Let's go. Come on. We can do this. But, verse 31, but the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge we even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers, and that's what they thought too. The English Standard Version says, we were as grasshoppers in our own eyes. In our own eyes, we seem to be like grasshoppers compared to them. You see where that inferiority, that despair comes from. It comes from a lack of confidence based on your own self-evaluation is not having enough strength. You ever felt like a grasshopper? Just a tiny nothing, something so weak and fragile, and God calls you to conquer the promised land, and you say, Lord, I'm just a grasshopper. Well, no matter what you think or what anybody else thinks, listen to what the Spirit has to say to the church at Philadelphia. I know all the things you do, this is Revelation 3 verse 8, and I have opened a door for you that no one can close. You have a little strength. You have a little strength, yet you obeyed my word and did not deny me. Look, I will force those who belong to Satan's synagogue, those liars who say they are Jews but are not, to come and bow down at your feet. They will acknowledge that you are the ones I love. And because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world. Listen to what Jesus says, the one who holds the key of David in his hands. Listen to what he says. You, church of little strength, because you have kept my word, I will fight your battles. I will defeat your enemies. They will be bowing down before you. And I will protect you from trials and testing. It's an underdog story. It's very similar to what happens in the story of David and Goliath. You remember, as David reflects upon this challenge between Goliath and the champion of Israel, who ought to have been King Saul, not David, by the way. And King Saul, you remember, was a big guy too. He stood a foot above most men. But he didn't go out and fight the battle. He sent a little shepherd boy to fight the battle. And the little shepherd boy understood what King Saul didn't understand, that it wasn't about him and it wasn't about Goliath. But as David's words, the battle belongs to the Lord. 
Jesus tells the church at Philadelphia, yes, you are small, you are weak, you have but a little strength. And then he tells us what that little strength is. What is it that was strong in Philadelphia? Was it their riches like Ephesus? No. Was it their reputation? Was it their strategic location like some of the other churches? No, they didn't have any of that. What did they have? They obeyed the word of God. They kept the word of the Lord. That was their strength. Today, there are a lot of people who mistake the Lord's blessing as from an earthly perspective as big numbers and big reputations, big projects. But the Bible seems to have a special appreciation for the small, for the weak. The Apostle Paul, of course, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 tells us, that it is in weakness that I am made perfect. It is weakness that I'm strong. Because it's God who gives us our strength. Sometimes we have to remember that little is much when God is in it. Look at what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning there in verse 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. Paul talks about the, the gospel as something that would seem as foolishness to the Greeks and a stumbling block to the Jews. But then in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 26, he tells his readers, the church at Corinth, remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Remember that. We have a tendency to attribute certain characteristics to people based on superficial things. For example, did you know that taller people are always thought to be smarter than, than people who aren't as tall? And you know what? That's absolutely not true, <laughs> right? It's absolutely not true. In fact, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say if, if we did IQ tests, it would be normalized across the board. Height has nothing to do with it. People who are what the world considers good-looking are sometimes considered smarter. Have you ever seen a picture of Albert Einstein? Sometimes our, our worldly thinking causes us to make mistakes in our own evaluation of ourselves. But here's the good news. God doesn't need you to be tall and beautiful and smart. Those are all wonderful blessings and things to be appreciated, but that isn't what God is looking for. God's looking for someone who will keep his word even when everybody else rejects it. God is looking for someone who will humble themselves to obey his word even when it's out of fashion. Even when you're the small little church that's left willing to do that. Listen to what Paul says. Remember, there were a few of you folks who were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. That key word there is in the world's eyes. Remember that, verse 27. Instead, God cho chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things that despised by the world, looked down on, despised. He chose those things, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring nothing, bring to nothing what the world considers important. Verse 29, as a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. Now, you might have noticed that when Jesus writes letters to the churches of Asia, most of them are pretty stern, pointed letters, 
full of rebuke and criticism, not one corrective statement is made to the church at Philadelphia. Jesus didn't write this letter to Philadelphia in order to right any wrongs or correct them in any way. He wrote it to encourage them, to remind them of the hope they have in Christ and that what they need to do is take that little strength they have and persevere with it. Persevere. Knowing that little is much when God is in it. Now he mentions in verse 10, uh, Revelation 3 verse 10, he says, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to protect you. There's trials coming on the world. There's a great time of testing that's going to come. Now, if you read the rest of the book of Revelation, you'll get to hear all about that. There is coming some great trials and testing. But this church, they have God's protection. What an amazing thing. What about personally? Not just the church of Philadelphia, but personally. Does God protect us? Absolutely. Again, going to the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 10, verse 13. Paul makes it absolutely clear. He says, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so you can endure. Now, that word tempted in the English is the same as, and the Greek is the same as the word testing. Temptations, testing, it's the same. And here you have the assurance from Paul that God will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we can bear. Jesus tells the church at Philadelphia, I will protect you from great testing. This protection is something that gives us confidence. Sometimes I hear people talk about all the terrible things going on in the world. They talk about the spiritual battles that we have to fight and how there's these forces of evil in the world. And I think at, at a certain point, I'm like, well, are you worried about that? Well, maybe so. We should be concerned about those things. We have to take them serious. But at the end of the day, we know who's won the battle. And if you're a Christian, don't get worried about what anything going on in the world is going on. What, that's, you, you are in the Lord's hands, the one who holds the key of David. If you're a Christian, don't be worried about spiritual evil spirits out there. I know that, you know, there's a time coming up where people are going to be thinking about that. Don't, we have the Holy Spirit. And he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. You don't need to worry about that. What you need to worry about is what the church at Philadelphia was encouraged to focus on, to take their little strength and persevere, holding fast to the word of God. That's it. That is it. You might be sitting here this morning thinking, I don't know what this has to do with my life. I've got other fish to fry. I've got problems I got to deal with. This isn't very helpful. I, I know you might be thinking that. But I'm going to challenge you. Put your faith in God's word every single day. Get up and focus on being obedient to what the Bible says. Now, your problem might be you don't know what the Bible says. Fair enough, okay? There's a solution to that problem. You can read the Bible. You can come alongside somebody who's been reading and studied it for a long time, and they can help you read it and understand it. You can come to church and listen to messages from the Bible. You can go to Sunday school and learn more about the Bible. There is no excuse for somebody not getting into God's Word and letting the Word of God have its effect in your life. And if you will just do that, the Lord Jesus says, He who holds the key of David says, I will open a door for you and no one can close it. I will protect you from great testing. What did the church of Philadelphia have to do? They just had to trust Jesus. Just hold to his word and persevere by the grace of God. Finally, Jesus says that he's going to make them pillars in the new Jerusalem. 
Jesus put it this way, the last shall be first. We might look at a church like Philadelphia and we might think, well, you know, not much going on there. They're just hanging on. I've heard preachers talk like this, you know, because they're all focused on numbers and data and analytics, trying to figure out how they can reconfigure and program the church to success. And they'll see a church that isn't experiencing a lot of growth and they'll say, well, you know, they're on a decline curve. Or that's a dying church. I imagine there were churches that looked over at Philadelphia and said, Phew, not much going on over there. That's a dying church over there. Jesus said, they're going to be pillars in the new Jerusalem. And I'm going to write my name on them. Throughout the letters, Jesus had said, I'm going to write on the forehead my name. I'm going to write a new name for you. Over and over again, he says, no matter what the world calls you, you're mine. So you can imagine the little church at Philadelphia with its little strength. They hear this letter as a letter of hope. They hear this letter as a way to take confidence in the Lord. I was listening to a, a, a song by, well, I mean, they call themselves psychedelic Christian music. I'm not sure what that is exactly, but that's what they call themselves. Um, and one of the lines is, you need to find your zeal for the Lord. And I thought about that. I said, what does that mean? Find your zeal for the do we, do we lose our zeal for the Lord? Well, yes, we do. So let us find it. Let's find our zeal for the Lord, even when we're down and out, even when we're the underdog, even when all we have is a little strength. Let's find our zeal for the Lord. Now, what about this open door? Well, in Revelation chapter 4, just turn to the next chapter. Scripture says, Then as I looked, I saw a door standing open in heaven. This is John, right? The, the revelator, what he saw. I saw a door standing open in heaven. And the same voice I heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. There's a door open in heaven. Who do you think opened the door? And can anyone shut it against you? Well, the church of Philadelphia, they knew that was not the case. No one could shut that door. It had been opened for them. That's probably the proper understanding within the book of Revelation. That this is the open door to the eternal life promised in heaven. But we know throughout the scriptures that this phrase, an open door, is used for a lot of things. And, and one other area that concerns the church is the open door to evangelism. In Colossians chapter 4, there in verse 2, Paul says that he had been praying and he, he asked the church to pray that a door would be opened to him for the gospel, that he might speak the word of God to those who needed to hear it. So it could also mean not just a door open to salvation, but a door open to evangelism. Whatever door it is, if that door opens, no one can shut it. No one can shut it. You hear stories about places where the Bible is forbidden. It's against the law to have a copy of the scriptures. You hear play about places where it's illegal to preach the gospel. And yet, you know what happens? People find Bibles. They find copies of the New Testament. They find people to share with them the gospel, even in those places where you might think the door had been shut. And the reason is, Jesus said, go into all nations and preach the gospel. Make disciples. 
baptizing in the name of the Father, name of the Son, name of the Holy Spirit, and I will be with you always. The door of evangelism has been open and no one can shut it. But what do we do? We come up to that door and we think, oh, I don't know, I don't feel like I'm really confident to share the gospel. I see it's open. There's an opening, but probably for someone who's stronger in their faith, probably for someone who's a better speaker, probably for someone who knows the Bible a little bit better. You know, I'm just going to pass this open door. Leave it for someone else. Jesus says, I've opened a door for you. No one can shut it. And the little strength you have, that's all you need. Just keep the word of God and walk through the door. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, we thank you and we praise you for who you are and for what you've done for us in Christ Jesus. We know, Father God, that there is nothing that we bring to offer you except that you have given us that offering in your Son. And so we praise you, and we stand on your grace. We thank you, Father God, that it's not about how great we are, but it's about how great salvation you have made for us in Christ Jesus. Help us, Father, to use whatever strength we have, however little it may be, to glorify you every day, to persevere in keeping your word, that we might be pillars in the new Jerusalem and that you might claim us as your own and put your name on us and say that we are yours. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.